Thank you for that introduction. Can everyone see my slides okay? Yep. Awesome, okay. So the didactic portion for today, I'd like to focus on the use of pharmacogenomics in patients with epilepsy. A few short objectives are to review the current CFIT guidelines for VGX testing with phenytoin, carbamazepine, and oxcarbazepine, evaluate the clinical utility of drug gene pairs with a lower level of evidence, and then discuss the ethical considerations with PGX testing. So to start off, in general, I think we all know that treating epilepsy can tend to be a difficult situation. We have several different drugs available to us, but unfortunately, a lot of the times patients have adverse effects to these medications. So at least one third of patients develop at least one ADR from any of the anti-epileptics that they take. And in addition to that, treatment resistant epilepsy often occurs as well in one third of patients. So they take many different medications, but remission does not always come easy. So we know there is a large interpatient variability in both efficacy and toxicity amongst these patients on AEDs. Several of the commonly used anti-epileptics are shown here in the chart. And with a few of these, we do have some genetic information available, but not all of them. I suspect this is likely a review for everyone, but the major CYP enzymes involved in the metabolism of several of these anti-epileptics include CYP2C9, CYP2C19, and CYP3A4 and 5. Genetic, genetic polymorphisms are quite common in CYP2C9 and 2C19, but less so with CYP3A4 and 5. Several different AEDs rely on glucuronidation for elimination, so variants in these different enzymes can also result in altered metabolism. There is conflicting evidence on how the expression of transporters like p glycoprotein can affect drug response and resistance, but we do know that HLA polymorphisms can impact the likelihood of certain reactions like cutaneous reactions and liver injury. And then finally, gene mutations in the mitochondrial polyp gene can increase the risk of liver failure from certain medications. So the FDA table of pharmacogenomic biomarkers includes several medications used commonly in neurology. And the different AEDs that the table includes are shown here. For these different drugs, the label includes information on how genetic variants can impact response to the drug that they're associated with. So while we do have evidence for some commonly used AEDs, we currently only have two CPIC guidelines for those. And the first CPIC guideline that I wanted to highlight is that for phenytoin and CYP2C9 and HLA-B. So in summary, regardless of the CYP2C9 phenotype in patients who are positive for HLA-B1502, Phenytoin should be avoided due to the risk of developing severe cutaneous reactions like Steven Johnson syndrome. For CYP2C9 poor metabolizers, the recommendation is to reduce the maintenance dose by 50%, and then additional adjustments are made based on therapeutic drug monitoring, efficacy, and adverse effects for each patient. In patients who are CYP2C9 intermediate metabolizers, the typical maintenance dose should be reduced by approximately 25%. So phenytoin is a drug that has a very narrow therapeutic index. There are many different you know, factors that go into how a patient responds and side effects, especially severe side effects are not uncommon. So to have some help on board with guiding certain drugs, certain drug doses, excuse me, can be very helpful, especially because drugs like this that are associated with these severe side effects aren't necessarily used as first line options anymore. And then the CPIC guideline for carbamazepine and oxcarbazepine discusses what to do for certain HLA genotypes. In patients who are carrying an HLA B1502 allele, these patients may be at an increased risk for those serious cutaneous reactions. And these are sometimes fatal. And again, that is like the Steven Johnson syndrome type reactions. And in those patients who are positive, it's definitely recommended to avoid these drugs if at all possible. And then, you know, and sometimes benefit may outweigh the risk, but serious consideration should be taken before prescribing these medications if you know someone is positive. <laughs> 
Some of the other aromatic AEDs should also be used with caution if a patient's positive, just to essentially rule out any additional risk of these side effects. And then patients who are positive for HLA-A3101 are also at a higher risk of the cutaneous reactions from carbamazepine. So it's generally recommended to avoid it in those patients as well. The drugs shown here are included in the FDA's table. And for the first one, Brivaracetam or Briviact, blood levels can be increased by anywhere from 22 to 42%, depending on if the patient has one or two mutated alleles for CYP2C19. So for CYP2C19 poor metabolizers, or even patients who are using inhibitors of CYP2C19, a dose reduction is likely recommended to avoid any serious side effects. For clobazam or onfi, for CYP2C19 poor metabolizers, the level of the active metabolite and desmethyl clobazam will be increased. So patients who are known to be CYP2C19 poor metabolizers, the starting dose should be five milligrams per day. And the dose titration, again, depends on weight, but should be done slowly and up to half of the recommended highest dose. For diazepam, there's no specific recommendations. It's just noted that for a CYP2C19 poor metabolizer, systemic concentrations of diazepam may be impacted. And then for leucosamide, there are no clinically relevant differences in the pharmacokinetics found between CYP2C19 poor metabolizers and extensive metabolizers. So that's you know, what we have so far in terms of recommendations for leucosamide. And then for valproic acid, this drug is contraindicated in patients who have a known mitochondrial disorder that's caused by the POLG mutations. It's also contraindicated in patients under two who are suspected to have that mitochondrial disorder. And then it also should be avoided in patients with known urea cycle disorders. So the reason for that is because hyperammonemic encephalopathy has been shown to occur in these patients who have urea cycle disorders, and it sometimes has been fatal. So the next few drugs are used very often in patients with epilepsy, but pharmacogenomic information is lacking. So I included some examples from the clinical annotations section in PharmGKB. For these drugs, specifically cannabidiol or Epidiolex to start, there's no clinical annotations for that drug, but we do know about some important CYP enzymes involved in its metabolism. And the drug itself also inhibits or induces some different CYP enzymes, so drug interactions are quite common. And then for lamotrigine, the Dutch Working Group guidelines recommend against lamotrigine use in patients who are HLA-B1502 positive. And PharmGKB clinical annotation states that patients may be at a higher risk of cutaneous reactions, but at this point, the evidence is still kind of conflicting. And then as well for lamotrigine, for ABCG2, there is some conflicting evidence on the impact of certain variants on serum lamotrigine concentrations. And then lastly, for levetiracetam, patients who are HLA-A1101 positive may be at a higher risk of psychiatric adverse events. For phenobarbital, certain ABCB1 genotypes may result in either a decreased or increased likelihood of resistance to phenobarbital. We know that there are other genetic and clinical factors that impact response, but for right now, what we do know is related to ABCB1 in terms of pharmacogenomics. And then for CA12 with topiramate and zonisamide, this is important because serum bicarbonate levels can be impacted by certain genotypes, and this may impact the risk of metabolic acidosis sometimes seen with these drugs. And then lastly, again, for topiramate, um, one clinical annotation states that in patients with alcohol-related disorders prescribed to pyramid, serum concentrations were impacted by specific GRIC1 variants. So there are still barriers to pharmacogenomics testing in patients with epilepsy. We do know that genetic factors likely contribute to inter-individual variability in both response but evidence to predict efficacy and toxicity of many of these anti-epileptics is still limited.
there are a few examples where testing can be recommended in routine clinical practice, but that's only for a few of the commonly used anti-epileptic agents. There are still many of those drugs that we just don't have enough evidence for, and so how we use them in clinical practice is still up for debate. So it's definitely an area of future research, and hopefully additional publications will come for these other medications, since we know that translating research into clinical practice does take time. These drugs are often very high-risk medications. They have frequent poor outcomes, both relative to the efficacy and tolerability. So really any help in drug selection with these agents would be beneficial.